So we're going to wrap up this unit by talking about compartmentalization within the cell. So talking, um, just kind of reinforcing how the organelles separate um, specific processes, possibly enzymes, act for storage, and the benefit that that will offer the cell. So let's talk about compartmentalization first. So compartmentalization um, is basically the cell has various compartments, right? These organelles where it's going to do particular functions within the organelle. And so the membranes that surround these organelles are what are dividing these compartments up. And the purpose of this is so that you can get these intracellular, so those reactions that are happening within the cell. So these intracellular processes and enzymatic reactions can be contained. Some of them, you may not want them to be anywhere near other parts of the cell. Right. Some good examples of this would be in the mitochondria. Okay, so in the mitochondria, you have cellular respiration occurring. And that cellular respiration is compartmentalized within the mitochondria. Right Within the mitochondria, remember, we ha are going to have the, that inner membrane that's going to help increase the surface area. To do cellular respiration, the mitochondria needs to create a gradient. It needs to build up on one side of the membrane. It needs to build up lots of hydrogen ions. And so it cannot do that if the mitochondria as a whole is not enclosed. And so that is an important part there of the compartmentalization there of the mitochondria would be helping it to create those gradients so that it can do cellular respiration. Chloroplast. So a chloroplast is going to, oh, we don't have a chloroplast in our picture here since it's an animal cell, but a chloroplast would um, help compartmentalize photosynthesis. Again, during photosynthesis, we need to create gradients, okay? and to be able to do that, you need to have enclosed areas. And so the chloroplast will um, conduct photosynthesis in a compartmentalized manner. Lysosomes, right? remember lysosomes are the ones that contain digestive enzymes. Well, digestive enzymes, if they are not contained, they will break down other parts of the cell that are maybe not supposed to be broken down. That's why your stomach, the digestive enzymes within your stomach, they're fully contained. There's a valve at each end. There's a sphincter at each end of your stomach, preventing, ideally preventing those um, enzymes from leaking out. That's part of what gastric, um, gastric reflux is, is those enzymes are going up into the esophagus, and the esophagus isn't meant for that acidic stomach juice with those um, with that acidic gastric juice to head up in there with those enzymes and the acid and so it starts it irritates the esophagus and that's what the pain is so within the cell you have these lysosomes that are going to be compartmentalized because they have a lower pH because those enzymes there work better in that lower pH setting so they have a lower pH um, and that you don't want escaping out into the rest of the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum, in particular the rough endoplasmic reticulum, is going to also have some uh, compartmentalization aspects to it. While it's modifying those proteins, okay, it will modify those proteins within. It'll send those proteins into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum and do that protein modification within that compartment there. And so this has a few benefits. Okay, so one of the benefits is that it helps minimize your competing reactions. So for instance, a lysosome that's trying to break something down or an endoplasmic reticulum that's trying to um, help modify the protein, it keeps these processes separate from one another so they don't compete with one another. They're not competing for, um, they're not competing for substrate. They're not competing for um, molecules that they may need to be a part of their chemical reaction it just kind of keeps them separate. It also allows for that increase in surface area for reactions to occur. Again, that would occur in the mitochondria in particular and the photosynthesis. So by having that compartment there that they can then fold the membrane multiple times within that compartment, that can help increase the surface area so more of these chemical reactions can be occurring in that particular area. So the origins of compartmentalization are thought to be based in our endosymbiotic theory. Remember, our endosymbi endosymbiotic theory is that larger prokaryotes 
consumed or engulfed the smaller ones, right? And then eventually over time, they couldn't exist without one another. So that smaller prokaryote initially was a free living um, cell that could live all by itself. That was not a problem, right? And then the larger prokaryote, though, eventually you can see it here engulfing these smaller prokaryotes. And so eventually they ended up living in the same cell. And those are what are thought to be the beginnings of our membrane-bound organelles. And so by following this endosymbiotic theory, we have the basis there for where these internal membranes are coming from that partition the cell out into various compartments, that they're coming from these ancestral prokaryotes that were taken in and that were consumed by the larger cell. So our endosymbiotic theory is providing evidence and support here for these internal membranes being within the cell. So prokaryotes, even though they don't have membrane-bound organelles, they still have specialized areas within their cell. And those specialized areas within their cell are separated by what we call inclusions. And these inclusions are just cytoplasmic structures that basically will hold, um, maybe they hold a particular compound, or it's the area where the um, DNA is concentrated, but the, or the area you know, where ribosomes are. But these inclusions help kind of separate out areas of the prokaryotic cell so it can do more specialized uh, functions by having these specialized structures that allows it to do more specialized functions. So again, some examples of that would be, um, for instance, again, here in the nucleoid region where the DNA is contained. That would be an example of an inclusion there. Uh, where the ribosomes are, like we said, would be an example of an inclusion. Okay? And then um, this particular picture doesn't have any in them, but again, remembering that some of them can store nutrients, almost acting like a vacuole uh, for the prokaryote, prokaryote, which is going to, again, allow it to do some of these more specialized functions like a eukaryotic cell can, even though it does not have um, specifically have membrane-bound organelles, meaning that these inclusions aren't separated from the rest of the cell by a phospholipid bilayer. That's what surrounds our membrane-bound organelles, right? That's why endocytosis and exocytosis are able to happen, right? Because eventually as this vesicle comes over to join with the cell membrane and release its contents out into the cell, right, if we're doing exocytosis, that vesicle was made of phospholipids. That's why it's able to become part of the cell membrane after it releases its contents out. These inclusion areas are not surrounded, are not made of the phospholipids like the cell membrane is. So that's it for unit two. Okay? We're just kind of tying it all together, again, hitting that structure and function stuff, um, again, looking at this kind of separation within the cells, and again, how that is going to dictate our function. Okay? And so this will be the end of Unit 2.